But good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, eh, the Sudanese rising revolution, chaotic situation, whatever you want to call it, attracted a lot of interest in, in around the world, and many people considered it as something uh, worth looking into and studying how uh, started, how it continued, and how it succeeded, and why it succeeded. Although it is still its success, it's the minds of some people doubtful. Let us hope for the best. One of these people was very much interested in the Sudanese revolution, it's Professor Stephen Zanis. Professor Zanis is from the University of San Francisco in the United States in California and he is a political scientist, professor of politics and interested in the Middle East, the Near East, uh, politics and uh, social uh, development. Uh, he came, he's one of the people who have supported the Sudanese uh, uprising uh, since its uh, beginning in December and continued writing about it and uh, being uh, consulted by TV stations, by newspapers, and by government in the United States, both the State Department as well as uh, the Congress. And so he has been following it closely. And in one of the murals, actually, in Underman, uh, in the East paintings in the vaults, you know, with Ariad, his name is mentioned among some uh, others who are from, but not non Sudanese outside who have been supporting uh, the revolution in many ways. So we are pleased today to have Professor Zalis Stephen uh, to address you about his, uh, what he wanted or what he thought to call the brilliance of the Sudanese revolution. I will not take much time. Please, you are welcome. Thank you. Uh, thank you for uh, the introduction. Uh, thank, thank you for hosting me uh, this week. I am in Sudan on your lovely campus. I was um, here a few days ago with, after the first uh, a large meeting of matriculation of students, and I, I, uh, I remember seeing hundreds and hundreds of you walking past the guest house, uh, cheering, uh, ululating, uh, celebrating uh, the beginning of your term here. And I couldn't help but think that you are in a much better situation than previous years. Uh, because you have, you are getting your university education in a free Sudan, and the future therefore looks much brighter than it had previously. And so I am truly honored to be here today, and I say this not simply as a formality. I am honored because the Sudanese people are heroes. Your victory was a victory not just for Sudanese, but for all Arabs, all Africans, indeed all people who seek freedom and justice around the world. You are an inspiration. I have studied civil resistance movements against autocratic regimes for decades. I have published policy briefs, book chapters, academic articles, examining such pro-democracy struggles as those in Egypt, Bahrain, Tunisia, Palestine, 
Yemen, Syria, Lebanon, Bolivia, Brazil, Honduras, Kenya, South Africa, Western Sahara, Mali, Ukraine, Georgia, Serbia, South Korea, Indonesia, and the Philippines, Thailand, and elsewhere. And I have never known of a successful nonviolent revolution which has achieved so much against such incredible odds. Sudan, in my view, is the most impressive of all these revolutions. You are amazing. You're just amazing. Um, of course, you have a history. In 1964, when the country was ruled by military dictator Ibrahim Aboud, large protests coalesced into a crippling general strike that forced him from power. A series of unstable civilian coalitions governed the coalition until a military coup in 1969 led by Jafar Nameri. But his repressive rule ended in 1985 in two weeks of largely nonviolent demonstrations and a general strike led to his ouster by the military. The protests continued until the military agreed to hand over power over to an interim allow for democratic elections. Of course, pro-democracy activists in 2019 faced a far more difficult situation. In his 30 years in power, al-Bashir's regime decimated Sudanese civil society, including the country's once vibrant trade union movement, and imposed an ultra-conservative Islamist system backed by a brutal police state. Despite the severity of the repression, a series of uprisings and mass protests for freedom swept the country, despite many activists being arrested, tortured, and killed. People did not give up, however. As a result, while the finally successful revolution took many by surprise, it was not a surprise for me and others familiar with your impressive history of civil resistance and your desire for freedom. One thing that excited me about your revolution is the way that it has challenged many of the myths some people have in the West regarding unarmed civil insurrections. One myth is that nonviolent tactics can't work against highly repressive regimes. But of course, Sudan has generally been ranked as having one of the most bloody, violent, totalitarian regimes in the world. Al-Bashir has been indicted by the International Criminal Court on multiple counts of genocide and other war crime, crimes against humanity, and other top military leaders have been implicated as well. And pro-democracy activists were gunned down on the streets, in Khartoum and elsewhere, and, and yet the protests continued. In addition, unlike the 2011 uprisings in Tunisia and Egypt, in which the largely nonviolent movements also, where, where the nonviolent movements also included riots, arson, and violent confrontations with security forces, protesters here in Sudan made a conscious choice to remain almost completely nonviolent, with only occasional and, and very minor exceptions. A second myth is that civil resistance can't work in impoverished countries with high literacy and poor infrastructure. Sudan, of course, is one of the poorest countries in the world, exacerbated by armed conflicts, uh, rampant corruption, drought, and despite being one of the largest countries in Africa, a uh, lack of adequate transport and other basic infrastructure. Literacy is among the lowest in the Arab world. The country ranks near the bottom of the Human Development Index. Yet despite this, millions of people, millions of people were successfully mobilized across the country. A third myth is that successful nonviolent struggle is unrealistic in countries with serious ethnic divisions or ongoing violent conflicts. 
Sudan, of course, has suffered from violent internal conflicts and civil war for most of the period since independence. Um, war waged by separatists led to the uh, South becoming independent, uh, but fighting and fighting you know, continues along the uh, the new border, the war Darfur region in the west, the, um, and it, which of course included genocide against the Floor uh, population was continuing. Um, uh, the Arab-led military government discriminated against other minorities as well. Yet all virtually all major ethnic groups participate in the uprising. In addition to the protests in, in, in here in, in, in Abdurman and Khartoum, massive demonstrations took place in such northeastern cities as Atbara, where the uprising began, and of course Sudan, to southeast to uh, El Ghadarif, to the western city of Al Afashir. And what this what I'm saying here is that the Sudanese people have demonstrated is that both the desire for political freedom and the strategy for nonviolent civil resistance to obtain such freedom is not restricted to a nation's level of development, political stability, structure of governance, or its particular ethnic, religious, and cultural traditions. The Sudanese demonstrators' willingness to maintain a strict nonviolent discipline far greater than in many pro-democracy struggles in so-called more developed countries, is also an important reminder that the appreciation of the strategic importance of nonviolent action is far from being primarily a Western construct. And it affects what the Sudanese people showed is that if it can be done here, it can be done anywhere. Um, Future struggles in other countries will see Sudan as a model. What you have done here has not only led to your freedom, it will likely lead to the freedom for other people as well. And, 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 and uh, despite Western stereotypes to the contrary, Islamic countries have been at least as prone to large nonviolent struggles as other societies. One of the great strengths of Islamic cultures, which make unarmed insurrections possible, is the implied social contract between the ruler and subject. Prophet Muhammad's successor, Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, stated this explicitly. He said, obey me as long as I obey God and my rule. If I disobey him, you will owe me no obedience. And such a pledge was reiterated by successive caliphs, including Imam Ali, who said, no obedience is allowed to any creature in his disobedience of the Creator. Indeed, most Islamic scholars have firmly supported the right of people to, de to depose an unjust ruler. The decision to refuse cooperation is a crucial step in building a nonviolent movement. Massive non-cooperation with illegitimate authority is critical for any successful struggle. What makes the Sudanese revolution significant is that the ruling regime tried to depict itself as having a monopoly on what constitutes Islamic governance. For decades, they tried to depict themselves as manifesting Islamic rule, so therefore, if you oppose the regime, you must oppose Islam. What the resistance was able to do was to help people realize that not just as Sudanese, not just as Muslims, they no longer owed this illegitimate regime, despite its disingenuous use of Islamist rhetoric, any obedience. You are able to portray them not as true Muslims, but essentially as, as merchants of Islam, and use Islam to sell their rule, not out of a, 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 a genuine following of the faith. Another significant factor which serves as an example 
of the movement's strategic wisdom and a model for others is that unlike many in the pro-democracy movement in Egypt earlier this decade who naively trusted the military to be an ally, the Sudanese remain steadfast in demanding civilian leadership despite the continued strong role of the country's armed forces. Refusing to be placated by initial concessions that the transitional government offered and demanding civilian leadership was a high-risk strategy, but one that ultimately had high rewards. The Sudanese armed forces and regime-backed militia had shown a willingness to order large-scale massacres, and we, we know the mass killings that took the lives of nearly 300 people. However, pro-democracy forces recognize that enough ordinary soldiers and an emerging younger generation of more moderate middle-level officers would refuse to engage in even worse mass killings and they nevertheless persisted despite great, per great personal risks and the martyrdom of hundreds of people. So, how did the Sudanese people finally win? I see several factors. One is that some of the main elements of the repressive apparatus of the regime, the police, the, the intelligence, the military, the Janjaweed, were divided. And the opposition did an excellent job of exacerbating those divisions and using them to the movement's advantage. Another factor is that the African Union and the Europeans were on the movement's side thanks in part to efforts by the exile community and others to mobilize their support. A third factor is that business people, even those who supported the, uh, the, the rulers, realized that for the sake of the economy and therefore their own self-interest, they had to end their support for military rule and support democratic governance. Again, this was thanks to the movement successfully convincing them that this was the case. A key factor is very important was the scope and the scale of the movement. Unlike some civil insurrections I've studied in other countries which were almost exclusively in the capital and with mostly middle class support, the Sudanese revolution took place all over the country in all the different regions with the support of a diverse class and ethnic makeup. It was not just students and professionals. You had working class neighborhoods that were mobilizing in resistance. And as we know, for decades, the regime sought to divide and rule North versus South, Muslim versus non-Muslim, Arab versus non-Arab. But the movement said, no, we reject this. When they tried to blame the unrest on the floor people, the chant became, we are all Darfur. And in Darfur, they started chanting, we are all Khartoum. You refuse to be divided. And in unity, there is strength. Related to, to this diversity was the strong participation and leadership by women which not only helped increase the numbers, but provided a perspective that encouraged nonviolent discipline, democratic process, and credibility, and better popular perception of the movement and its goals. Indeed, the ability to build such a broad coalition was vitally important given the size and complexity of this country. And perhaps the single most important factor, and we're going to go back to this, is the nonviolent discipline. Maintaining nonviolence made it difficult for the regime to depict the movement in a negative light. It gained the movement's sympathy it would have otherwise lost through violent tactics. And it made it possible for people to feel comfortable joining the protests, therefore increasing the numbers. Now, I am not a strict pacifist. I don't believe that, that um, nonviolence, uh, it, you know, ha people have to be nonviolent all the time. But um, the, 
that strategically, tactically, it was clearly the wisest choice. The Sudanese did not choose nonviolence because you were Gandhians. You did so because you didn't do it on, you know, on strictly moral grounds. You, you did so because you knew that tactically and strategically it was the best way you could win. If the movement had used violence, the regime could have just escalated the violence. The, the regime had the advantage in means of, of violence. But what the movement did was, in effect, choose a different weapons system. Your weapons were nonviolent. Your weapons were protests, occupation, strikes, and more. They were, they, 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 they were unable to say, oh, you know, these people are terrorists. These people are, are going to plunge the, the country in a massive civil war. No, you, it showed that you were the ones who were disciplined. You were the ones who wanted stability. Um, that you were modeling the kind of future that Sudanese wanted, a nonviolent future. Now, we all know that the agreement was an imperfect compromise. We know that the uh, military still has influence, and many people in the old ruling establishment still are in positions of influence in the bureaucracy and elsewhere. Um, but because it was not a total victory, it will hopefully keep people engaged in the process to defend what has been won and to work for even greater democracy and civilian control. Continued civic engagement is important. The future of Sudan cannot be left solely to the leaders of political parties and other elite elements. A civilian government must have enough legitimacy in the eyes of enough Sudanese so they are willing to defend it if threatened. One way of doing that would be to challenge corruption, not just against those in the military and former ruling party, but those still in government, as well as certain archaic cultural practices and wealthy private interests, both domestic and foreign. An anti-corruption campaign could be a unifying proposition that could bring in diverse ideological elements and it could be valuable in defending and advancing civilian control. Another way of defending civilian rule would be to find a balance between national identity and regional interest. Pushing nationalism as an alternative to the reactionary Islamist narrative of the old regime has its merits but over-centralizing power in the capital could alienate other regions. I, 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 I would encourage Sudanese to think about developing a system that maintains the overall unity of the country while respecting the reasonable interests of individual regions and ethnic minorities. Too much centralization of power could breed resistance at a time when support for democratic governance is critical. It's not up to me or any other outsider to give advice, however. My job as an American is to encourage my government to support your democracy and end its sanctions against Sudan. My job as an American is to challenge Washington's support for authoritarian regimes, including the leadership of Egypt and the monarchies of the Arabian Peninsula, which, who, who would like to see Sudan's democratic experiment fail. My job is, as an American is to try to stop a war with Iran and other forms of military escalation that will only destabilize the region, encourage extremism, and divert resources needed for human development. And my job as an American is to spread the word about your and the need to support its consolidation. Uh, the Sudanese revolution has gotten some attention in the United States. 
Um, a widely circulated article by Medea Benjamin, a leading uh, activist, talked about the, that despite all the terrible things that have happened in the United States and around the world uh, this year, we should celebrate the good things. And she gave a list of, of 10 examples, and one at the top of the list was the Sudanese Revolution. But at the same time, I've been disappointed that the Sudanese Revolution has not gotten more attention in the United States. And it led me to wonder why this might be the case. And unfortunately, my sense is that uh, the having an Arab people, a Muslim people, an African people exhibit agency, thinking strategically, and effectively utilizing nonviolent action simply does not fit into the Western narrative. The Western narrative is served by the belief that Arab peoples, Muslim peoples, African peoples are incapable of democratic self-governance, are violent and irrational, and thereby necessitates the backing of authoritarian regimes if they're allied to the United States, or engaging in sanctions and direct military intervention if they're not. Um, I mean, I received a background briefing at the U.S. Embassy on Sunday, and it was quite revealing. Uh, the view of the embassy appears to be that they believe that corruption is too endemic, that the military is too entrenched. They don't really think that a stable democracy can take hold here. And like uh, most people in U.S. foreign policy establishments, they seem to see power in traditional terms of who has the guns, who has controls of the formal political institutions. They see power as a top-down phenomenon. Yet history has shown that ultimately power comes from below. Uh, and in the early 1960s, the United States assumed that its ally, General Abud, would remain in power. But the people rose up and overthrew him. Um, when Namere was eventually embraced by the United States, we assumed he would be in power in a definite period. Indeed, he was visiting Washington in April of 1985 when the uh, uprising uh, took place. And similarly, few in Washington believed that Bashir and his military supporters would be removed from power by the massive nonviolent resistance we witnessed this past year. And yet it happened. Time after time, Governments have underestimated the power of nonviolent resistance. It was not the leftist guerrillas of the New People's Army which brought down the U.S. backed Marcos dictatorship in the Philippines back in 1985. It was nuns praying the rosary in front of the regime's tanks and the millions of others who brought, brought Greater Manila to a standstill. It was not 11 weeks of bombing that brought down Serbian leader Slobodan Milosevic, the infamous Busher of the Balkans. It was a nonviolent resistance movement led by young students whose generation had been sacrificed as a series of bloody military campaigns against neighboring Yugoslav republics who were able to mobilize a large cross-section of the population to rise up against a stolen election. It was not the armed wing of the African National Congress that brought majority rule to South Africa. It was workers, students, township dwellers who, through the use of boycotts, strikes, and the creation of alternative institutions and other acts of defiance made it impossible for the apartheid system to continue. It was not NATO that brought down the communist regimes in Eastern Europe or freed the Baltic republics from Soviet control. It was Polish dock workers, East German church people, Estonian folk singers, Czech intellectuals, and millions of ordinary citizens. Similarly, such tyrants as Jean-Claude de Valier of Haiti, Augusto Pinochet in Chile, King Yanandra of Nepal, General Suharto of Indonesia, Zine al-Din bin Ali of Tunisia, and other dictators, from Bolivia to Benin, from Madagascar to the Maldives, were forced to step down when it became clear they were powerless in the face of massive nonviolent resistance and non-cooperation. History has shown that strategic nonviolent action is actually more effective than armed struggle. A recent study by a Washington Research Institute demonstrated